And greetings from the hot, hot pines of southern New Jersey. This is Far Out Radio with Scott and Karen Teeters. I'm Scott, and today is Tuesday. It's July the 17th, 2013, and I hope you had a great day. Hannah Crum, the kombucha mama, makes a return visit with us this evening. Hannah was with us last January of 2013 to talk about the delicious probiotic drink, kombucha. And on uh, this past May of this year, Hannah was with us to talk about the issue of GMOs. And tonight, Hannah and I will talk about fermented foods. It's an extension of kombucha, so I thought it made a lot of sense. The uh, most well-known of fermented foods is, of course, pickles, sauerkraut, and cheese. But a deeper look into the topic of fermented foods shows that there is a large variety of foods and drinks that can be easily fermented. Of course, the fermenting of food goes back thousands of years, and it was a safe and proven way of preserving fruits, vegetables, meats, and fish. But with the introduction of modern refrigeration in the 20th century and mass production of food, the fermenting of foods, for the most part, has fallen by the wayside. After all, it's a lot easier to just buy a jar of pickles or sauerkraut at the supermarket than it is to make your own pickles or sauerkraut, which raises the question. Are modern fermented foods as tasty as their old counterparts? Are modern pickles really fermented? Some would say yes, or are they just salty, pickle-like pickles? Are they as good for you? Do supermarket pickles from a jar have any beneficial probiotics? Hannah will explain why it is that genuine fermented foods are so healthy and good for you. She'll also explain how easy it is to make your own fermented foods. So imagine that. Foods that you can easily make yourself that are not only rich tasting, but are very, very healthy for you. Robust health and vitality is not necessarily difficult to achieve, as we have been led to believe. And in many cases, The old ways are the best ways. So get some pickles, pull up a chair, and let's have some kitchen fun. Hannah, are you there? Welcome to the program. Yes, Scott. Hi, how are you? I'm fine. I'm fine. How are you? Great. Well, we're talking about one of my favorite subjects today, which, of course, is fermentation. Um, Mm -hmm. Did you know that the root word fermentation comes from the Latin fervere, or to boil? I didn't know that. Because... It, well, what what happens in the fermentation process is um, the way that ancient people would know it was starting to work is they would see foam, like bubbles, and it looked as if the pot was boiling. And that's how they knew that the fermentation action was occurring. Hmm. There you go. So Thanks for that uh, little factoid. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a bit of a word nerd, so for me that's like fun information. Oh, uh, that's all right. This idea of boiling and bubbling and percolating, these are a lot of the things that we really love about our fermented foods because it's an indicator that that healthy bacteria is doing what it's supposed to do. And so when we go to eat those foods, we know we're going to get that healthy bacteria into our bodies as well. Right. I, I, so uh, before we get into this, uh, uh, you got a big tall glass of kombucha there in front of you? You know it. <laughs> I'm drinking Garden Dew right now. This is a, a, a flavor that I make with uh, lavender, oregano, and thyme, all from my garden, hence the name. Very nice. Very nice. I've got a glass. What flavor of, are you drinking today? I've got blueberry apple orange. Very fizzy. Mm. Very, very fizzy. Yeah. Actually, actually after good. it's been sitting out, after I bottle it, if after it's been sitting out for about three or four days it's in need of, the bottles are in need of some serious burping uh this stuff gets uh-huh. really fizzy <laughs> which is fun and what you see when it gets really fizzy are all those bubbles right uh yeah all the bubbles uh you know rocketing sometimes rocketing out of the top of my grolch bottles <laughs> you have to be careful with these darn things uh if they, they get geysers actually, yeah, and if actually if they get a little too hot, you know, on the, as far as the uh, the uh, carbonation is concerned, I just put them in the refrigerator to cool them down a little bit. But uh, it's great stuff. It's great stuff, and we're That's we are tip. we're we're only a couple of weeks away from being uh, a year into uh, the first uh, batch of uh, kombucha that we that we bottled and uh, enjoyed, and it uh, we're still working on that same, uh, well, it's probably the relatives or the children, the great-grandchildren of the mother scoby that we purchased from you. 
Yeah, well, I mean, that's that's the nice thing about all of these cultures and, and fermentation is that we don't really need, you know, once we have the culture, it reproduces. So it's, mm-hmm. it's something that you don't have to go back and buy again and again because as long as they're feeding it, it's going to reproduce. Right. Yeah, that's, that's one of the cool things about all time. this. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, I guess it was maybe 10 or 15 years ago when I first became aware of probiotics that you buy at the store. Uh, you know, I saw them at the health food store. I thought, what the heck is this, a, a probiotic? And it was explained to me what it was. And, uh, you know, it's of course, it's, uh, you know, little capsules or, or in a jar or a, a bottle or, or on, a, on a piece of cardboard or whatever, um, you know, in those blister packs. And, uh, you know, you, you, I, I think I got a couple of those things one time, and I took them, and I didn't feel bad to begin with, so I didn't really notice much of any difference uh, at all. And I, I might not have even finished uh, the bottle of them, but, the, the, you know, the whole probiotic stuff in the capsules just sort of went, you know, drifted away from me. But uh, last year when we discovered uh, kombucha and how to make it and the fact that you're making a probiotic drink, which turns out in our house to be a, a wonderful substitute for soda pop, uh, I said, well, okay, now you've got my attention. So that's what, the, that's what led us to uh, the, wor- the wonderful world of kombucha. Since well, you are I like the- to think Go ahead. that soda pop wishes it was a fermented beverage. It's trying to imitate a fermented beverage in many ways, right? It's got the fake bubbles because it wants to have the natural bubbles that occur mm-hmm. from fermentation. And it's um, it's got a little bit of acidity to it, which is something we find in the fermented foods naturally occurring. And so, in my opinion, soda is the fad, and the fermented drinks and the, the fermented foods, these are the ones that are here to stay. Mm-hmm. And, of course, before they started uh, manufacturing, uh, mass manufacturing soda pop, uh, there was soda. Uh, natural soda, because if you go online or if you look in the the book that uh, that I have here that I'll be referencing, it's the uh, <laughs> it's the complete idiot's guide to fermenting foods. You know, one of those dummy kind of books, which uh, mm-hmm. is actually pretty good. But uh, so yeah, soda has been around for a long, long time, and uh, you know, of course, it took on a different dimension when uh, when ice became uh, readily available. But uh, this stuff's been around a long, long time, and uh, Coca Cola didn't invent it. Yeah, that's right. But, you know, prohibition helped move all of that forward. People uh, were fermenting drinks in order, you know, before prohibition, the water was very unpotable. And so the way that people would be able to imbibe it or make it so that it wouldn't harm them from drinking it is they would often ferment with it. So whether that was making beer or other types of um, low alcohol fermented, naturally fermented sodas, this was a way in which we could transform the water so that it wouldn't have a harmful effect. And we'd get all the benefit of the of the healthy probiotics that were coming through that as well. Right. I I remember when I stumbled across the, this little factoid that uh, back in the uh, back in the, the olden days, like two hundred and thirty some years ago, um, you know, during the beginnings of our nation, uh, cider uh, was extremely common. It was one of the re- one of the reasons why everybody had um, apple trees, so they could easily make apple cider. But uh, people drank cider um, basically all the time throughout the day. You get up in the morning and you have a cup of cider, uh, which sounds a little like you're you're drinking hard cider. Now, this wasn't like drinking liquor, but there was a small amount of alcohol in it. But the reason reason for it was just what you said, the fact that no one could really trust the water. Well, and uh, I'll go a step further with you there, Scott, and, um, you know, there have been numerous studies showing that low amounts, moderate consumption of alcohol on a regular basis helps to uh, lengthen the life and the lifespan. And when we see that the root cause of most disease is diet or stress and consuming these small quantities of alcohol on a regular basis, it makes a lot of sense why that would help because it's it's creating a relaxation or or stress-relieving effect without necessarily having to take it to that extreme of getting drunk, per se. But Mm -hmm. your body's able to metabolize those low alcohols. Because a naturally fermented cider isn't going to have nearly the alcohol content of, say, a shot of tequila. Um, So it's something that you can have uh, a small amount of. It's not going to impair your functionality. And that relaxation effect is going to um, just help alleviate that stress and make you feel better. Mm -hmm. Now... (laughs) <laughs> Pardon me. Since we sort of drifted into this alcohol thing um, in the past year, when I have when I've uh, told people about uh, 
about the kombucha. Um, you know, I've been asked the question about the alcohol content. Now, about where is kombucha percentage-wise? Um, it's really, yeah, it's really similar to uh, like an apple juice that's been allowed to ferment from a 0.3% up to, say, a 1%. So Point. we don't really find it being a, a high amount of alcohol. It's low enough, again, that our bodies are very easily able to metabolize it without, right. you know, like getting that buzz that impairs you. And, um, and again, it has that really relaxing effect. Do you ever drink your kombucha first thing in the morning on an empty Oh, yeah. Shot? Yeah, absolutely. Yep. You well, when you. I do that, what I observe H- is Hannah, that after some, a certain Hannah, point... Hannah, we got some music playing in the background, which means we're going to take a bit of a commercial break. And on the other side, we'll talk about what we drink first thing in the morning. You're listening to Far Out Radio. Hannah Crumb's with us this evening. We're talking about fermented foods, and we'll be right back. back and we're spending some time this evening with our friend Hannah Crum. She's the kombucha mama. And uh, we're talking about kombucha, fermented foods, and fermented drinks this evening. And if you'd like to learn how to make uh, these healthy, versatile, this healthy, versatile drink, kombucha, that costs just pennies to make, visit Hannah Crum's website. It's kombuchacamp.com. That's spelled K-O-M-B-U-C-H-A. K A M P dot com. That's Kombucha Camp. She's got lots of articles, how to videos, and all the supplies you need to get started to make kombucha. It's very, very simple. Okay, Hannah, on the other side of the break, we were talking about the alcohol aspect of, of kombucha and fermented drinks. And you mentioned an interesting fact that, that the alcohol level in kombucha tends to be tends to run between what did you say, point three and one percent? That's right, and that's in a properly fermented kombucha. And, again, that's similar to any glass of fruit juice um, mm-hmm. that, okay. that may have been left out. So, so um, you know, if, there's, alcohol occurs in everything, right? including our even, body. Even on the high side, if it was uh, 1%, an average mm-hmm. beer has, I think it's around 6% alcohol content. So you would right. have to drink... Six 12 ounce bottles of kombucha to equal one beer. That's a lot of booch. I mean, I like kombucha too, but I wouldn't sit, I wouldn't drink six 12 ounce bottles at one sitting. That's for sure. Well, and here's the thing even if you, if you drank all six of those bottles and did so in a fairly short time, again, the, the, the amount of alcohol is so minute that the body's able to metabolize it before it even has that cumulative effect. So, mm-hmm. it, the, the truth is, unless you're you're very sensitive, and, and every body is different, so every body is going to have a different reaction, but unless you're very sensitive to alcohol, most people don't even, um, can't even tell that there's anything in there or don't even feel it, just as they don't notice it when it's in, um, you know, soda or anything else. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's not something that is, is something we should worry or stress about or like, oh, I'm, you know, is this going to not allow me to do my job or to do what I need to do? Um, but rather, it's just it's mindful that that's one of the healthy aspects of it. Now, I've had a few people uh, say to me that they're on various medications, and their doctors told them they are absolutely forbidden from having any alcohol at all. Uh, and you just say, well, okay. <laughs> well, I told them what type of alcohol. You know, this because we evolved with fermented foods and fermentation, you know, likely our, our very first fermented food that we knew about or gravitated towards was maybe honey in the crook of a tree. So uh, mead or something would potentially be um, one of the first things we might have fermented. And then if we look at the hieroglyphs in Egypt, you know, they, they very much had a culture of brewing beer and making all kinds of fermented drinks from the grain and things that they had available to them. So, again, this is something that human beings evolved with. And when we look at, you know, what does it mean to be a human being um, from drinking kombucha and my journeys of discovering what it is, for me, what I've, I've come to understand is that we are bacterial sapiens. And so the, the healthy bacteria that are present in the fermented foods are those same healthy bacteria that help to colonize our gut and boost our immunity. And, and there are different bacteria that live on the exterior of our body, but that, again, are also, they're part of our natural force field, our natural immunity. And so... In evolving with the fermented foods, you know, we our bodies really need those in order to function properly. And so as a result of the processed foods industry, um, you know, it became just popular in the 50s. You know, why make everything at home when you can just buy it at the store, right? And, right. and we shifted away from fermentation to 
vinegar preservation. And while that's a, you know, that streamlines the process, it makes it easier, gives you a more consistent product, what we've lost is our bacteriological heritage. And um, you compound that with the, with the trend towards antibacterial soap, um, towards chlorine in the water, and, and towards over-prescribing of antibiotics. And you see how these have taken a huge toll on our bacterial brethren, on the, on the good ones, you know. And unfortunately what happens is when you're using that antibacterial soap, not only does it kill the quote-unquote traveler bacteria, the, the ones that might be potentially harmful to us, but it also kills the ones that are supposed to live on our body. And when we do that, we literally strip our entire force field off, and that leaves us even more vulnerable than if we just, they rinsed our hands with some soap under the water, mm-hmm. because that will allow our natural bacteria to still remain, even though uh, we're getting rid of those traveler bacteria. You, uh, you mentioned beer, and I saw a, a, a program on Netflix that was about the history of beer, and it was produced by one of those Monty Python fellows. So it had a lot of that dry Python-type, you know, British humor to it. But they, they spent some time talking about how the ancient Egyptians were very good at brewing beer and that their beer was so rich in nutrients that it was just about a full meal. Yeah, and the way you described it, I thought, oh, God, I'd like to try some of that. Thank you. <laughs> mm-hmm. Well, and I, we are able to try some of that these days with the craft beer industry because um, some beer makers are moving towards not pasteurizing their beers. Now, uh, the industry is set up such that they don't have to label if something's pasteurized or not, but so the ones that aren't often say they're unfiltered or um, you might notice there's some residual yeast on the bottom. And in Europe, beer is considered nutrition. And as much as we have kind of gone to an extreme end of saying, you know, no alcohol, don't consume any alcohol while pregnant, and certainly we're not advocating anybody go out and, you know, do a bunch of shots or anything while they're in that state, it, you know, through history, women have consumed alcohol during pregnancy and didn't have a problem. And, again, it's quantity and amount. Also, after they were done giving birth in Europe, it would be in the hospital they would give women beer as soon as they had given birth because they knew it had so many nutrients and it would help give them the nutrition they needed to produce the breast milk so that they could feed their children. So we have a very different perception of beer here in the United States, but um, in other places and in other times in our history and in other cultures, it certainly has had that other perception where it is something that's healthy for us. Mm -hmm. And it could also help put those moms in a better mood. (laughs) <laughs> well, exactly, right? So so it helps alleviate the stress, that's right. And then the yeast, and this is what we also see in the kombucha, is the yeast um, creates these B vitamins. And their B vitamins, it's different than, say, if you take a B vitamin supplement, right? So if you're taking it in a supplement form, it's likely been created through a chemical process. Mm-hmm. Whereas when we take the, the B vitamins it, it, through a beer or something, maybe they're in such small amounts we wouldn't even consider it to have any nutritional value, but it's in a living form. It's in a form that our bodies have literally evolved to be able to absorb and utilize instantly. And so even though it's trace amounts of nutrition, it's nutrition that our bodies can actually use in that moment. Yep, it's all there and all of its, and its uh, infinite little tiny parts that uh, all work together like a symphony. And uh, it makes all the difference. Hannah, we got some music playing in the background. I think that's the Pink Panther. Yep. So we're going to take a wee bit of a break. I'm going to fill up my uh, glass of, with some more booch. And on the other side, we'll get into more about fermented foods. We'll be right back, folks. Okay, we're going to let the far out fermented conversation take you away this evening. Hannah Crumb's with us this evening. She's the kombucha mama, and we're talking about kombucha. And we're going to get into some other fermented drinks and foods and condiments and all kinds of neat stuff that's tasty and really good for you. And if you'd like to uh, enter into the world of making and brewing your own kombucha, which uh, Hannah and I highly recommend because it's just so darn tasty, you can get everything you need to know, uh, learn everything you need to know about kombucha and how to make it at uh, Hannah's website. It's kombuchacamp.com. That's spelled K-O-M-B-U-C-H-A. K-A-M-P dot com. She's got articles, videos, and all the supplies you need. So, Okay, Hannah, um, where were we on the other side of the break? We were talking about uh, alcohol, actually. Well, we were talking about, <laughs> that's right, um, and it, the fermented foods having evolved with us, you know, as we mentioned before, um, 
we had we didn't have a way to preserve our food unless we used this type of process so that we could have nutrients um, even in the winter and at times when maybe our, our, a fresh food supply wasn't available to us. So um, all different cultures and societies from Asia to the Middle East to Africa to everywhere, they all have their own traditional fermented foods that were part of that process. Um, so whether these were vegetables that were fermented to store for long times in the winter, for instance, the kimchi in Korea, they would take the, the cabbage and everything they wanted to ferment and bury it underground. And then when winter came, they would dig it up and it would have vitamin C and B vitamins and things that they didn't have access to at that time of year because it was so cold and bitter. Um, we see this similar type of thing in, in Africa where they have several types of uh, grain porridges that they do through a fermentation process. And, and these, are, these are foods that are given to children. These are foods that everyone consumes because they have such a nutrient-dense profile. They're, they're, they're so beneficial to everybody. And, and like you were saying before, the condiments were all fermented. So you think of your salsas, your chutneys, your sauerkraut, and even ketchup used to be a fermented fish sauce. Um, how it turned into tomatoes, Tomato sauce as we know it today is, is a story I don't fully know, but, um, but it did start out as a fermented fish sauce. And so these were, these condiments were used in a way where they would add literally zip or zest or flavor. I mean, you think about chips and salsa. You love having that salsa on your chip because it just, it provides so much vibrancy and flavor. And so not only did it provide a taste zip, but it also provided a, a nutritional zip or a bacterial zip because you are also getting those healthy bacteria that would help you to digest the food that you were eating. I mean, look at a Reuben. It's piled high with all kinds of, of meat. And if you don't have that sauerkraut on there to help you digest all that meat, that can be a pretty heavy load in your gut. Mm -hmm. So these were things that, um, that, that have always kind of evolved with us in order to provide that extra nutritional element as well as the digestive element as well as the flavor element. Well, Hannah, since you are the kombucha mama, let's go back to and, and do a little review of uh, sort of kombucha 101. How do you make kombucha, Hannah, for our listeners? I would love to, Scott. Yeah, <laughs> kombucha is really easy. Um, it's basically you make a big pot of sweet tea. Uh, all of the measurements and information we have about kombucha in terms of the ideal conditions, um, whether that's temperature or pH or even the recipe as to how much sugar and tea to use came from research that was done at the turn of the 20th century. There was a lot of interest in kombucha because they were finding it it had anti-cancer properties and um, there was a lot of interest in it at that time because of those, those beneficial aspects of it. So, um, so making kombucha is really a breeze. Who's made tea before? I think everybody <laughs> has probably made tea. And, you know, so our first step is we boil the water, then we add the tea, after we steep the tea for, say, 15 minutes or so, then we remove the tea bags. We stir in our one cup of sugar, and once that's totally dissolved, then, and this was kind of a shortcut method that we're doing just because we want to protect the scoby and the yeast from extreme temperatures. So in this case, the amount of water we use is just about four cups. And then we fill up the rest of the gallon vessel with cold water because now that we have this concentrated sweet tea solution, we want to bring the temperature down quickly. So by then pouring cold filtered water into your vessel, you bring that temperature down quickly so you can immediately get your kombucha culture and starter liquid in there so they can get to work consuming that sugar and making the healthy acid. Now, if you so, put um, hot tea in your, in your, on your SCOBY, that's the end of your SCOBY, right? Well, you know, here's the thing. The, the kombucha culture is a, a hardy organism. So while some organisms say, like the, the water keeper grains or the milk keeper grains, if they're left too long um, on their own, they will eat themselves. When they run out of food, they just they turn it on themselves and they just disappear, so to speak. Uh, the kombucha culture is a very hardy organism, so it can withstand certain extremes in temperature, but the yeast are more sensitive. And so that's really what we're caring for with that type of temperature range. Because yeast are temperature sensitive, if you've ever baked bread, even if you use a commercial yeast packet, it always says use lukewarm water. Because if mm -hmm. you use it, if it's too hot, you'll kill the yeast and you won't get the benefit of, of the bed or bread rising. And even that's the kind of fermentation process. It's going through a chemical process where the yeast, again, are releasing that CO2, and that's what makes the bread light and fluffy. Mm -hmm. But so we want to be mindful of the yeast. 
Um, and here's the cool thing is, like, although they're in symbiosis where they're working together, so the yeast gets to work first, they start consuming the sugar, they're creating the CO2 and the ethanol, then the bacteria come in and they consume the yeast waste product. So the bacteria come in and they take that ethanol and they convert it into healthy acids. And that's part of why, just not the hard part of it, but to come back to the alcohol, it's self-limiting in kombucha because the, the bacteria are consuming the alcohol and converting that into the healthy acid. Um, so, so there's a two-step process going on in our fermentation process. But the bacteria needs, although they're in symbiosis where they, they feed each other, they're also in competition. And so um, there's plenty of wild yeast all around us, not to freak anybody out, but <laughs> they're everywhere. They're on everything. It's the little musk you see on the grape that then yes. is what helps ferment the grape into the wine. So, so yeast is something that is, is a normal part of our existence. Um, so when it comes to the kombucha, what we really want to be mindful of is cultivating the bacteria side of it because they're the ones that um, we need to keep them in balance with the yeast so that the yeast don't over-dominate them. When the yeast over-dominates, that's when we get kind of off flavors or beery flavors and maybe we see a lot of brown sludge in our kombucha. So, for instance, in that batch brew method, you always want to take your starter liquid from the top where the mother culture lives because that's going to be bacteria rich. And then it will have yeast strands attached to it. Like when you look at the bottom of the scoby, it's got all that kind of brown, goopy stuff hanging off of it. You want oh, yeah. some of that. Some of that is the yeast. And we want to, we want to get that to the next step so that we have a nice bubbly kombucha. Yeah, this is the first time I took the scoby out to uh, wash it off, it was like, oh, my God. <laughs> it's, it's such a strange looking thing. <laughs> really Absolutely. Is. And, I you know, that's why I think... <laughs> Well, right, people aren't afraid of yogurt. You know, if you give them right. yogurt, they're not like, ah, oh, yogurt, it's going to get me. And if yeah, you give them yogurt, sauerkraut, yeah, they're not like, oh, the sauerkraut. Yeah, but yogurt doesn't look like oh, yeah. a scoby. <laughs> That's exactly right. You're right. The, the bacterial cellulose is a little weird. It yeah, can seem strange yeah. at first. But when no, you realize, well, first of all, poor, they mean you no harm. They mean you a world of good. Poor then, scoby. Hannah, we're going to take a little bit of a break, and we'll be right back on okay. the other side of the commercials. We'll be back with Hannah Crum. Okay, we are back. Anna Crump, kombucha. We're talking about kombucha and other fermented foods and drinks. And if you're interested in learning how to make kombucha, go to kombuchacamp.com. That's K-O-M-B-U-C-H-A-K-A-M-P. And you can uh, tap into Hannah's articles, the videos, and also she has all the supplies you need to get started with this uh, amazingly inexpensive um, and uh, terrific drink. Okay, uh, you know, Hannah, uh, in the early part of the last segment, you said something that made me, and I, and I, could, I could feel it in my head, I connected the dots on something. Okay, and here it goes. You were talking about how it is that in our modern society we use antibiotic soaps on our outsides. We have um, uh, almost all of the foods that we're, we're now purchasing you know, via supermarkets are void of the, benefic- of the benefits of, um, of fermentation. And in, conjun- in conjunction that with that, we have all the medications and the on and on and on that, that, we, ha- that we have. Last week, actually last Wednesday, um, in the second hour, we had on uh, Dr. Edward Group, and we were talking about uh, uh, GMOs. And he was talking about, he mentioned leaky gut syndrome. And I, since I, I had a for real doctor doctor on the, uh, on the program, I, I, I had to ask him, I said, are, as a physician, are you seeing an epidemic of people who have leaky gut syndrome? And he said, absolutely. And the reason I asked the question is because I've known, I now know several people who have been diagnosed or they have all the symptoms of leaky gut syndrome. And Dr. Group's position was that part of what is basically eating holes in our, in our gut and in our intestinal tract are these funny, strange foods that we're eating and the fact that our gut bacteria flora level is not right anymore because of the foods that we eat. Well, and you're absolutely correct about that. And so let me give you a for instance here and kind of how, how our bodies absorb nutrition. Um, basically, we need to eat because our bodies can't synthesize every – we don't have the enzymes. We're, we're not able – we're not plants. We don't photosynthesize from the sun and get everything we need. So we need to consume certain foods in order to get those enzymes, which catalyze all of our bodily functions, right? That, that's what helps to make our bodies function properly. 
Well, think about it like a puzzle piece. So each of these enzymes, each of these proteins, they all have a different shape. And like we've seen the chemical, you know, the chemistry drawings where they have the, you know, the circles attached and the carbon and the hydrogen and all those, mm-hmm. those models that we've seen. Um, well, similar to that in our body. So our body is looking to plug in specific shapes that it then can immediately use. So, but, you know, let's say the shape for a, a, a vitamin or something. And, and when you get that in that natural form and it plugs right in, your body is instantly able to use it. It catalyzes all of the, the things it needs to around that process. Um, so the problem is, is that when we are consuming GMOs, when we're consuming pasteurized foods, um, and I'll give an example here using pasteurized milk, um, our bodies don't recognize those shapes. So here's the, for instance, with, with milk, um, is with raw milk, the protein in milk we see is a three-dimensional shape. And when our body recognizes that shape, it's able to use that nutrition instantly and absorb that. So we go through that pasteurization process and we heat that at that high temperature, it ends up flattening that shape. So now something that was 3D is now And when you go to consume that and, and it's in your body and it has nowhere to plug in because it's not something your body recognizes as, as an enzyme or a mineral that it can actually use, it thinks it's something that's attacking the And while you may not have a reaction the first time you have a glass of pasteurized milk, over time, the body's stressed out by constant exposure to foods that it doesn't know what to do with. And so whether that's the, you know, denatured foods or processed foods or, you know, foods that's devoid of nutrition, your body just simply over time can't handle it. Add to that, you know, the toxins in the air we breathe, the toxins in the water we're drinking, the chlorine that's killing all the healthy bacteria, and our bodies are simply responding to too much toxin. And and they're kind of like, you know, the canary in the coal mine a little bit in that our bodies are trying to give us a sign, hey, what we're doing isn't sustainable, what we're doing isn't nourishing for us, and we need to um, shift what we're eating. And that's and that's, in fact, how a lot of people come to fermented foods these days is because they're dealing with some kind of health issue, and they've heard, rightly so, that consuming nutrient-dense foods like fermented foods, whether that's your sauerkraut or your kombuchas or, or your, even your yogurts or water keepers, that, that these can have a healing benefit. And that's because they're, again, putting the healthy bacteria in our body. They're putting the nutrients that our body has literally evolved <laughs> since the beginning of time to recognize that it's plugging it back in. And that's, that's what our trust in your gut philosophy is all about because, honestly, Scott, your microbiome and the bacteria that live in your gut are different than the ones that live in my gut, um, whether that's because of where you live or the types of food you eat or how you evolve or whatever that is. Everybody has a different type of gut signature. And this is some of the really exciting science that's coming out from, like, the Human Microbiome Project or the American Gut Project where they're showing and again, it's early on, so there's not a lot of like X equals Y or, or whatever, but what they're discovering is that different colonies of bacteria, different dominant colonies of bacteria help people consume or absorb nutrition in different ways. So maybe for me, eating, eating meat is something that really provides me a lot of nutrition and energy. And like for my husband, who's always begging me to make more vegetables, you know, he needs uh, something else in his gut that's going to help propel his health forward. And that's why listening to your body and, and really trying to connect with what's going on inside of your body becomes a really telling way for us to figure out how do we then move from there into um, into figuring out which foods are right for us. Did you reference the American Gut Project? I did. Do you know oh, I've never that? heard of that. No, what is that? Um, this is an offshoot of the Human Microbiome Project. It's an independent um, project being done at the University of Colorado in Boulder. And uh, basically, they did a Kickstarter campaign or something similar where you could pay to participate. And uh, Michael Pollan recently participated and wrote about his experience um, with the New York Times. But the, basically, what they're doing is you send in samples, um, fecal samples, and they analyze them. And what they're doing is they're aggregating all of the data to see what are the commonalities across everybody. So what, what you end up with is a comparison of how your gut bacteria, what's specifically in your gut bacteria, and then how that then compares to the aggregate. And um, the findings were really interesting. If you go and Google that article and read about it, it, it 
kind of shocking just what they're discovering. And it, it's really interesting to, to, and it's kind of the next level in terms of understanding medicine. I mean, we've kind of figured out at this point that broad strokes doesn't really work. You know, all cancer is not the same. All manifestations of a disease don't just come from the same origin point. And so by getting down to that, you know, molecular biological uh, level, we're able to find the things that will help heal that specific person with their specific issue. Fascinating. It kind of reminds me of, of uh, getting your hair analyzed. Mm. Those are also very interesting. Well, Have you ever, ever seen the movie uh, King Corn documentary? Uh, it's on Netflix. I, I, I know, I've, I've, Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's on Netflix as a watch instantly, or at least I think it's still there, or there are chunks of it. And it's it, it's these two dudes, you know, you know, guys in their early 20s, real dude types, um, got their hair analyzed. And when they went to go get the results of their hair uh, analysis, the guy said to them, well, fellas, I have some good news for you. You're mostly made up of corn. <laughs> they said, huh? <laughs> And uh, it turned out that uh, the hair analysis showed that because of the of the diet that they'd been eating all their life of you know just regular processed foods, um, that most of their body was uh, you know derived from the corn products that they'd been eating over the years, and that set them off on a journey in this in this film about uh, so well, what is this corn stuff? So they they raised one square acre of corn in the contemporary fashion. In other words, they they bought the they bought the GMO seeds and they planted it and they mm. did all that stuff and they put the herbicide ready Roundup on there and and they they grew this this uh, corn looks like corn but uh, it's really only good for animal feed and, and uh, goo and paste and uh, high fructose corn syrup but it all started out with uh, this hair analysis thing. Think so how interesting. Well, and that and that's it. Is our culture. body has our body has all of the signs and symbols. We just have to start listening to it and. We've been given a lot of misinformation, and it's very confusing. You know, what is healthy? You know, one year eggs are good, one year eggs are bad. You know, the back and forth between all of that has left, I think, the average consumer very confused and frustrated and not knowing what they should eat or how they should eat. And, and that's why getting back to these nutrient-dense foods is so important because here's the thing. You know, there's a mythology that if, you know, and I'll go to, to eating meat or, eat, or eating these types of things is that, um, well, if we all consume in this way, then there's not going to be enough for the world and we're creating too much methane gas and we're, we're polluting the planet. So, but that's because you're following a model whereby, you know, we're treating the animals like they're in Auschwitz or whatever and they are tortured and then we're consuming the flesh of tortured animals um, that are fed food that they're not supposed to eat and they're hopped up on chemicals, but now all of that is getting passed on to you. I completely agree that we should get rid of that type of food supply. And that type of food supply is contributing to um, – an overabundance of methane gas and things like mm -hmm. that. But when we when we look at raising animals in a sustainable way and, and looking at Joel Salatin and his polyface farms and the way in which he follows the cycles of nature, again, returning to that ancient wisdom of the planet because everything is here for us. It's already right here. We just have to use our, our, our intelligence to leverage nature to work to our benefit. Because when you eat foods that are nutrient dense, you know what? You don't need to eat as much because your body is getting the nutrition it needs in a smaller form. And so mm -hmm. it's, it's, you know, even if people were eating meat on a daily basis, if you had the, the right source, and again, talking about source and environment and, and where is it that these things are coming from, these things are going to have a long-term beneficial effect because we'll be um, working with the planet in harmony and we'll be consuming it in the appropriate amount. And, Anna, let's and even pick that up on the other side of the news because ah, we're just more about music. Out of time. <laughs> yes, more music, more music. On the other side no of the problem. news, we'll be back with Hannah Crum and more conversation about fermented foods and why it's so darn good for you. We'll be back in just a few minutes, folks.